Hello and welcome to part four of chapter 12's lecture. In this part of the video, we will look at specific heat. So our first topic here um, of this, this is gonna be a, a rather short video. Um, we're gonna talk about specific heat, which is also called heat capacity. Um, so depending on the textbook and reference that you'll see, you'll sometimes see it called either one of these. In fact, sometimes it's even called specific heat capacity. Um, let's start off with a little thought experiment here. Suppose we transfer 500 joules of heat to a kilogram of water. All right, so, um, you know, we can think of putting the, a water, a liter of water weighs, uh, has a mass of one kilogram. So let's take this liter of water and put it on some sort of hot plate or, uh, and suppose we know that we're going to transfer 500 joules of heat into the water. So what's going to happen to the water? Well, obviously its temperature is going to increase. One question is how much will its temperature increase? So we want to be able to figure that out. And that's one of our goals here in this section. But another question is, what if we transfer this same 500 joules of heat to a, a kilogram, same amount of material, but this time of copper instead of water? Um, you know, and obviously the copper is, is going to heat up as well and its temperature is going to rise. But the question is, will its temperature increase be the same as the water? And the answer here is no. And the reason for this is because water and copper respond differently when heat is transferred to them. So even though it's the same amount of material, one kilogram, um, water and copper behave very differently in the presence of uh, heat being added. So um, this leads us to the concept of specific heat, which is given the um, symbol C. And this is, notice this is a lowercase c. So specific heat, uh, one way to think of it is a measure of a substance thermal inertia. And what I mean by that is its resistance to temperature change when heat is added. So more specifically, no pun intended, C is the heat in joules needed to raise one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So um, let's see what um, this sort of means here uh, with specific heat. So imagine we have two substances here. One has a high specific heat and the other has a low specific heat. And we pump in some heat, Q, the same amount of heat into both of these. Well, the material with the high specific heat has more thermal inertia or more resistance to temperature change. So it's going to um, only experience a small change in temperature. Whereas the material down here that has a low specific heat will experience a relatively large change in temperature. Let's go ahead and watch a um, short video uh, simulation that will help um, also kind of clarify this concept of specific heat. So this is a simulation tool that simulates the effect of specific heat. So on the left here is um, some material that has a small specific heat. So for example, this would be um, any metal has a relatively low specific heat. On the right is a block of material with the same mass as over here, uh, but it has a large specific heat. So this would be um, a substance, for example, water has a very large specific heat. So let's go ahead and uh, notice they're both starting here at room temperature, 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and underneath each of these, we're placing a source of heat. So it's a little lamp or flame um, that's going to add heat. So as you can see, once we turn on the, uh, the fire, um, we can see the thermal energy start to increase as these things heat up. But notice that the uh, material over here with the small specific heat is changing temperature much more rapidly than the material over here with the larger specific heat. So we see the uh, metal over here is heating up more uh, compared to the water uh, over here on the right side. And uh, you know, as we keep running this, uh, you can see the simulation is also showing um, the uh, material over here on the left side, a lot of thermal energy, a lot of motion of the atoms, and over here on the right side, relatively little. 
So this is a table of the specific heat of some common substances, um, liquids and solids. So um, notice, and, and these are organized from highest specific heat down to lowest. So notice at the top here is water. Uh, water has a very high specific heat. It's 4,190 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So what this means is it takes 4,190 joules of heat to raise one kilogram, which is one liter of water, by just one degree Celsius. All right. So um, and, and then notice, you know, as you go down the list, what's down at the bottom are metals. So remember, we talked about the water versus the copper. Well, what would happen is because the copper has such a low specific heat compared to water, the copper's temperature would change more than 10 times as much as the water's temperature, because look at the, the specific heat is less, you know, it's less than 10 times uh, smaller than the water specific heat up here. Now, um, interestingly, of course, our human uh, body uh, contains mostly water, right? We're comprised mainly of water. So our bodies have a relatively high specific heat. And actually, this is a good thing. Uh, you know, all organisms, basically living organisms, have water in them. And this water helps regulate our temperature in the presence of um, hot surroundings. So if we go out in the hot sun in the desert, for example, um, the water in our body is going to help regulate our temperature and allow us to survive longer than you know if we were made out of something like metal, for example, we would get extremely hot. Um, okay, let's move on from here. So speaking of water-specific high heat, as I mentioned, it takes 4,190 joules of heat to raise one liter or one kilogram of water by one degree C. This means that water can store lots of heat inside of its molecular bonds without getting hotter. And um, as I mentioned, this is good for um, heat regulation in living organisms like ourselves. It's also, it also means that water is great for putting out fires. Water can absorb the heat from a hot fire and um, its temperature doesn't change that much. In other words, it won't all boil away. Um, water is also a fantastic coolant for car engines, nuclear reactors, um, in industry. Whenever we're trying to, to cool something, machinery or a system, uh, it's good to pump water um, around or onto the hot system because water can absorb a lot of heat without its temperature going up very much. One of our main goals of this uh, part of the lecture is to come up with a relationship between the amount of heat we add to something and how much hotter the object gets. In other words, what is the temperature change? And so this is all captured um, in a relationship which I just call the heat temperature relation. And this is for solids and liquids. So it says that Q is equal to C times M times delta T. So we know Q, Q is heat, and that's the heat that's added to the object in joules. C is the specific heat of the object, and this is something that we will usually look up in a table. And, and you know, this is going to depend, obviously, on the material. Water has a very different specific heat than metal, for example. Um, M is the mass of the object in kilograms, and delta T is the temperature change of the object. And delta T, it can either be in degrees Celsius or Kelvins, with, because each of those um, one degree is the same for both of those temperature scales. Remember that this is the change in temperature. It's not the temperature of the object, but it's delta T. So let's go ahead and just look at a couple um, examples of how to use that heat temperature relation. The first one says, um, how much heat must be added to a 0.5 kilogram block of copper to raise its temperature by 10 degrees C? So you can imagine a, a little picture here. We've got this block of copper. Let's set it on top of a hot stove. We see Q, heat, going into the copper from the stove. So we know that um, Q is equal to Cm delta T. So all we have to do here is just fill in the numbers because we're trying to figure out how much heat is necessary. So C for copper, if we look back on that table from a couple slides ago, um, copper has a specific heat of 385 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. The mass of the copper, 
was given as 0 0.5 kilograms. And the temperature change, delta T, that we want here is 10 degrees C. So just multiplying these three numbers together gives us um, an answer of 1,925 joules. Now, the second part of this question asks, how much colder does the block of copper get if we place it on ice and remove 1,000 joules of heat? So now what we're gonna do is take um, a block of copper and we're gonna set it on a big block of ice. So heat is going to flow from the warm copper to the cold ice. So this time Q is leaving the copper. So we want to solve for the temperature change where we're asked how much colder does the copper get? So we're going to take this equation here and we're just going to solve it for delta T. So delta T is equal to Q divided by the specific heat C times the mass M. Now the Q here for this problem, notice that Q is leaving the system. So I'm going to put a minus sign in front of Q. We get negative 1000 joules. The specific heat is 385. Again, this is still copper and the same mass. We're assuming it's the same block. So it's 0.5 kilograms. So when you do this on your calculator, you'll come up with a temperature change of negative 5.2 degrees C. Now, what does this minus sign tell us? Well, remember, this is a delta T. So this means the change in temperature is going down, right? It's a, it's a negative change. So the temperature is dropping, and that's what we expect if we place this block of metal onto an ice block. There's something um, closely related to specific heat, and that is molar specific heat. So it's similar to the previous specific heat, but we're working in terms of moles instead of mass in kilograms. So just to clarify these and kind of compare and contrast the two, the specific heat we saw before, uh, which by the way is lowercase c in our textbook, this specific heat is the heat needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. The molar specific heat, on the other hand, which by the way, we're gonna use in uppercase C, is the heat needed to raise the temperature of one mole of a substance by one degree Celsius. So the only difference is here we're talking about kilograms or mass, and here we're talking about moles of substance. So the uh, heat temperature relation uh, for um, a, a, if this works actually for solids, liquids, or gases, um, looks basically the same. Um, we have Q is equal to C, but now instead of the mass here, we have N, which is the number of moles. Uh, you'll, this is the same lowercase n we saw from uh, Pivner to the ideal gas law, for example. And then delta T, of course, again, is the temperature change. So um, the difference here is this C, big C, is the molar specific heat of the object. And um, this is something, again, that we'll typically look up in a table depending on what the material is. And um, if there's any confusion regarding gases, uh, gases get a little more tricky, and we're not going to go into the details in this course, but um, gases have different specific heats for different processes. So in this case, what we would use is um, the specific heat for constant volume. So sometimes they put a little V next to the C there. Now, why would we use molar specific heat? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one, one is that if we deal with gases, uh, we're going to use the molar specific heat. The other one is if we um, if if we are using materials that are metals, there's something very interesting here. If we look at um, here's a, a listing of eight common metals, all right, copper, gold, iron, lead, etc. And this column here, this is lowercase c. This is the specific heat. And you can see they're, they're all over the map, right? We've got 385 for copper, 129 for gold, um, 128 for lead. Look at aluminum is 900 and so forth. So there, there's a huge range here in specific heats. However, look at the molar specific heat. This is the uppercase c. All of these numbers here, are around 25. In fact, if you average the eight of these together, you'll get exactly 25. Um, so this is uh, molar specific heat, by the way, the units are joules per mole per degree C, 
whereas this one here is joules per kilogram per degree C. So the molar specific heats of metals are almost identical. As I said, that's right at about 25. This is because the specific heat capacity depends on the number of atoms in the solid, not the type of atom. So um, let's look at an example here. So here's an, uh, an example of molar specific heat. How much heat must be added to five moles of any metal in order to raise its temperature by 10 degrees C? So here we're gonna use our heat temperature relation for with molar specific heat. So we have Q is equal to big C times N times delta T. And remember the molar specific heat for any metal, we can use 25. Right, in joules per degree C per mole. So Q here is equal to 25, that's the, the molar specific heat of a metal, times uh, five moles, times the temperature change, we want 10 degrees C. So multiplying these three numbers together, 25 times five times 10, we get 1,250 joules. Let's take a look at the first law of thermodynamics again, and now we can add into um, the um, mix here this idea of specific heat. So we know that um, if we add heat, um, we will raise the temperature of a substance, but we know also, if we recall from the first law of thermodynamics, that if we do work on a system, um, we're also going to raise the temperature of that system. Uh, so uh, we can say that either one of these, work or heat, will cause a, um, an increase in temperature given by the molar specific heat times the number of moles times the delta temperature. So we can kind of put all this together with the first law of thermodynamics. And this works for a solid, a liquid, or a gas. The change in thermal energy, delta E thermal, is equal to the work done on the system plus the amount of heat added and that is likewise equal to the molar specific heat of the object times the number of moles times the temperature change of the object. So let's go ahead and uh, do an example with this. So here's an example using um, the results from the last slide. A paddle does 10,000 joules of work while churning eight moles of water. So here's um, the situation. We've got this container that has eight moles of water. We've got a paddle inside here that's spinning. Um, you can think of this like a blender. And this paddle is gonna do 10,000 joules of work on the water. And meanwhile, there's a flame underneath our container of water that adds 20,000 joules of heat to the water. So that's shown as Q uh, going into the water here. Uh, the question is, what is the temperature increase in the water? So we have both work here and heat added here that are both going to increase the temperature of the water. So to figure out how much the water's temperature increases, we're gonna use the result from the last slide that says that the change in thermal energy, which is work plus heat added, W plus Q, that's equal to molar specific heat times N times delta T. And we're just gonna solve this for delta T. So we're gonna use these last two terms here of this equation. So delta T is equal to work plus Q divided by Cn. Now C here is the molar specific heat of water. And this is something that um, I had to look up. It's not shown in the table in this uh, lecture. So um, you can see it down here. This is the number here at 75.3 joules per mole per degree C. Up here, work was 10,000 joules. Q was 20,000 joules. So we have 30,000 joules um, divided by the specific uh, molar specific heat here. And then we were told the number of moles, that's N, um, is eight. So this comes out to be about 50 degrees centigrade. So that's the end of uh, this part of the lecture. Uh, we have one more part, part five, um, and I will see you then.